Not this time. All right. Excited. So right too. I'm pressing live now. All right. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabin's Experience. This is part two of my talk with Jerry Wang. Jerry, thanks for being here again. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Jerry, or can you give us a quick recap of your background? Sure, fantastic. Uh, I'm obviously Jerry, so I'm here in downtown San Jose. Uh, I grew up in Silicon Valley and uh, by default worked in, in tech for quite a while. Um, but before all of that, I actually spent time in the Marine Corps as a combat engineer from 2003 to 2007. Um, after I came back, uh, I was very fortunate to, to be able to walk myself into a job over at Apple and uh, start my tech career from that perspective. And I spent about the last 15 years in Silicon Valley working on a variety of different roles within tech companies, ranging from big, big corporate to small startups. Um, about <clears throat> eight years ago, I started the journey of teaching myself to code and was able to uh, move on to be able to do software engineering development and so forth and be able to lead teams on making digital products. Did some years with consulting, tech consulting, management consulting, and uh, the last three years kind of switched gears and I got into the retail space. So I actually opened up uh, a couple of restaurants and cafes. And now this year, I'm looking forward to try to figure out combine both of those together where I could implement a lot more technology for restaurant business operators. Um, so yeah, looking forward to kind of doing all of that. So so Jerry, can you talk some about the challenges of people entering the tech career right now? Cause you know, there's this, I think this myth stereotype, oh, go to Carter Academy, you know, get a hundred thousand dollars a year job, but it's really not that easy, right? Yeah. Um, so I actually, I actually started my process, my journey of learning to code a little bit prior to the, the phase where a lot of the, the code boot camps kind of popped up. And so when I first started back in 2009, 2010, it wasn't as, um, it wasn't as so much like you have a lot of resources available to you. There was resources available in the sense where a lot of people were willing to share what they learned in terms of coding, or there was ways that you could, you could figure out how to get started on coding, but you really have to have the momentum. You have to have the initiative yourself in order for you to seek out those resources. Um, so the way I actually did it was when, when I was working over uh, at a big corporate company, um, I would do my nine to five. And I was actually also very fortunate enough where uh, after five o'clock ends, um, I didn't have to take my work home. So I actually would stay in the office, um, hide, hide myself in the conference room somewhere, eat the free food and <laughs> sit there and then just really bang my head against the wall uh, watching YouTube videos, reading articles, or just trying my best to figure out how to uh, learn from trial and error. And that was a very frustrating process for close to six to nine months where it was in the beginning, it felt like you're trying to, you're going to the gym and you're trying to figure out how to catch up to all these people who are able to put, you know, push out 300 pounds weights left and right. And you think to yourself, I, I want to do that. How do I do that? Right. And so you start off with the bare minimum of like, I'm on a, I'm going to learn what are the, what the terminology, how to do this, how to do that. And inch by inch, slowly but surely, it got to a point where I got some more comfortability. I got more confidence in terms of being able to know what I'm doing. Um, and I was also very fortunate that after I kind of started that process, six months later, randomly on Craigslist one day, I applied for a job for a software engineer job. And it worked out and I was able to work at this spot, a startup in Berkeley, California for quite a while. And that's just kind of escalating the point where I was able to, I kept on saying yes to, to opportunities, right? So I think that was also the big thing too, is just be determined, keep on trying to find opportunities. And I was able to work myself into a situation where I became the product lead. I was managing a team of five other developers over in China. I had to uh, figure out how to work remotely. This is way back before all the, all the things I'm doing right now. And just trying to figure out how to make use of tools to communicate effectively, plan effectively, um, test for stuff and then figure out how to find out how to build features. Um, I think my tips to people is definitely don't necessarily look at it as if I just go to code boot camp that that inevitably leads to a job because I did have an opportunity also to work on the HR side for big corporate. And from my perspective, what we learned is just because you show up with a say a, a um, you know a, a stint over at code academy, doesn't necessarily automatically lead you to being competitive because there's so many factors that go into play. Um, for example, if you go through code boot camp and you don't time your 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 exit correctly, say you actually end up uh, graduating in the summertime, 
you actually put yourself in a situation where you're competing with a lot of people who actually went through a four-year school or two-year school, and they too are very competitive in learning and knowing how to do a lot of the stuff you're doing. Um, so my tip to people has always been just focus on the self-improvement, focus on the determination, focus on trying to figure out uh, why is it that you want to do this, right? If it's for the money, um, salary-wise, the more that people are gaining, the more that people are getting into um, the field, the, obviously the, the lower the price is going to be for everyone's salary. So it's not going to be, it can't be a financial incentive. You really have to really like the fact that you can build stuff um, whether from the internet, for a phone, or for something like that, or you're really interested in you figure out how to build something for people to use. If you could focus on those things as the drive for why you want to learn software engineering or to work for a company that has uh, digital products that's serving lots of people, I think that's going to get you through a lot of frustration, a lot of the uh, uh, challenges, the roadblocks that you're going to face along the way. Um, that said, inevitably, as you get yourself past those and you get to a very comfortable level where maybe you're past the junior level of, of being a soft engineer, um, the world does open up quite a lot. Um, you get a lot more opportunities where people are really eager to always find something, find someone like you that would be interested in helping them maybe start a company or uh, build products or be able to get into consulting or be able to move on and get into a situation where you're, you're managing a product that maybe could be touched by billions of people, for example. Um, so it's a, it's a long grind for me personally. I've been in Silicon Valley for close to 15 years and I'm, I'm still not even close to being at the very, very tip top, right? But like from my perspective, I look at it as, you know what, I feel very fortunate and grateful that I get to work um, in a space where I feel really, really happy about where I get to work on technology, I get to work with phones, I get to work with computers, I get to work with all these fancy cool stuff. It feels magical to be able to say, hey, you know what, if I want to make a TV display certain things or I want to show data or I want to show reports, I want to show charts that I have at least the, the thinking to be able to kind of think that through um, and then be able to have, you know, the have the confidence that, you know, because I, I went through I went through a very grueling process of learning how to code that um, I could actually execute on something like that. So definitely don't be discouraged. Definitely figure out how to find a determined way for you to, to stick with it. Um, and uh, the, the, the thing to also think about too is like you never stop learning. Like even to now, I'm still having to, to read through manuals of new code uh, releases, new versions, trying to figure out what is it that you know something's changed or how something's new. Um, the amount of effort that everyone else in this community um, putting out all these amazing stuff that never stops. So you're always going to be engaged with like new learnings, new new methodologies, new best practices, new ways of doing things. It's it's a very intriguing field to be in. Hey Jerry, can you talk about the importance of new developers? You know, having like always having a side hustle, so to speak, and also either having a portfolio or some have some stuff on GitHub. That is actually the by far the fastest, easiest way to get noticed. Um, the trick that we figured out way, way back has always been <clears throat> the resumes themselves speaks somewhat well in terms of kind of understanding who you are as a person. But at the same time, um, when you're when you're trying to figure out how to find these particular jobs, what someone is looking for is they're looking to see if they can actually, you can actually execute. So. In that sense, showing off your, your side projects, showing, showing off your previous work experience, showing off your actual code is the most, honestly, the most direct way of getting uh, the right people to take a look at you and say, hey, this might be the right fit. Um, when I was in the position of, of hiring, um, my go-to was always has always been twofold, uh, two things. One is show me your GitHub profile. Um, let me let me see let me see a couple of things. Let me see one just how you write your code. Is it messy? Do you document? Um, let me take a look at your code commits because I could track. I could get a sense of like how you're going through the process. You know, by looking at your code commits. Do you commit multiple times throughout the day? Do you commit late at night? Do you commit early in the morning? Um, do you make lots of sloppy mistakes or do you recover and clean up your your um, issues along the way. Um, I also take a look at whether or not you're implementing, and this is the thing that most people forget because they're so, in, they're so early on in the process. Um, professionals get to the point where they know how to code and then they also know how to test for that code. And so a lot of times you get into a situation where um, self-taught developers, for example, kind of miss out on that aspect of it. But 
If I could see that someone has put effort and thought and care into maintaining their code base to the point where they're also maintaining the test units, the test suites, and being able to document the fact that everything is tested for, that also shows the elevated level of understanding um, that kind of separates you from the pack. The other thing too, also, that is very, very helpful has always been just to say, hey, have you actually put anything to production? Have you actually got anything into the point? And it doesn't even have to be something fantastic, but, um, just Jerry, because you can code. Yeah, go ahead. I, I think I think you'd be able to bring point because it's like a lot of developers, they love to build and go from sexy object to shiny object, but they never launch anything, right? They never finish anything, right? I think that's a great point you just bring up. So that's actually the trick that most people actually fall through. Um, you, it, It's a three-part journey in a sense where you have to get into the, you have to get into the first shallow end of the pool by learning how to code. Um, you have to rewire how your brain thinks. You have to think more logically, more systematically. You have to learn the terminology, the grammar of a coding, um, a, a code language. So that's the first aspect of it. The second aspect of it is to establish professionalism, which is to say, I could actually build this code base. I could maintain it. I could test for it. I could know if something's wrong. I could actually think through where that issue could be, right? You don't have to know how to resolve any bugs, but at least you kind of have to have a general sense of like, you know what, if something's broken, I, I could kind of guess a general sense of where that is, right? So that's the next intermediate level. The final level you have to get to is you have to get to the point where you're actually in production phase. When that means is um, you, have, you have a nice little widget, you have a nice little mobile app, but actually, have you gone through the process of working with uh, Apple uh, or Google to get into the App Store or the Play Store? <clears throat> that in itself is a whole wide range of issues, right? Um, and it could be a challenge. Like if you ha if you have gone through that process, it definitely puts you miles ahead of most people that actually haven't got there. Because as you're going through that process of publishing something, of, of getting people to actually download it, um, you learn a lot of things along the way, like how do I actually build it so that way it's, it's easier for me to maintain it so I can keep on you know, updating it along the way. How do I even write release notes? How do I even gather feedback? How do I set up reporting so I can even know, like, you know, are people even using the features that in my mind, six, nine months ago, I thought was gonna be a, a killer feature, a killer app that you know, the whole world is gonna use. So, so I think it's a, it's a three-part process and most people kind of start at the first part and they kind of think that my, 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 my race is done, right? But in reality, it's, it's a relay race where you have to get through each section to the point where you're very comfortable in saying, you know what? I actually know exactly what are the security files I need to, to generate in order for me to send this over to the app store for them to accept it. Because if you can make it that far, it definitely puts you in a situation where you could take on product leadership a little bit more so. Which in all reality, I'll be honest with you, this is why I kind of thought to myself, this is almost exactly like going to Hollywood. Everyone, a lot of times people want to be actors, but in reality, they want to be directors. So I think a lot of times people want to be coders when in reality, they want to be product managers. They want to figure out how to make something, right? That a lot of people are using on their phones, on their computers. Coding is just a way for you to be in that role. A lot of times, sometimes people want, want to step into a product management role, but then the thing is, is that if they start shooting off left and right different features that they don't have the technical expertise to kind of back them up and understand why they would do certain things, they're not going to be a very good product manager. And it's not to say that you have to be a coder in order to be a product manager, but it does help out if you could kind of do, if you have some basic understanding of all these little, all these little technical issues in the back. And so what I kind of learned from myself is I find that people who have that urge of saying, you know what, I, I like coding, I like solving challenges, I like solving problem sets, I like thinking through how to manage my data sets and all that kind of stuff. I also eventually inevitably want to be in a situation where I have a little bit more say at the table as to what it is you're building, why is it we're building it? Right, and rather than just be on the other end of the other end of the table by saying, "Oh, I just I just got a whole new list of stuff I got to do from my email, and I'm just gonna crunch it out in my little cubicle or wherever I'm at, and never giving it more foresight or more thought than that." So I think that's also the other aspect to think about. So Jerry, I could be wrong, but like you talk about professor development for the um, coders, but I'm I'm guessing when I when a developer is hired by a company. That coder it th presumes that company is going to provide for, for professional development for them. But in reality, it's pretty much on the coder to professionally develop themselves, right? 
Yeah, I could see. Yeah. So it, it, it also kind of depends. There are situations where I have friends who work at way, way bigger companies where they're, <clears throat> they're, they're one part of the cog. They're one cog in the whole machine, right? Um, and so their, their role is actually very, very specific. And they get to work on teams where um, everyone has a role specific to what they're working on. And you get to some medium-sized businesses where maybe they don't have the luxury of having lots of, lots of headcount. And so you're really having to, to cover a lot of things, wear different hats. And then there's also the startup level where <clears throat> you actually have nothing. You have no resources, you have no people, and you're just trying to figure out how to make something happen. And so therefore you yourself have to kind of do every single thing. All along the way, people find, I feel like this is a Bruce Lee thing I learned a long time ago, water finds its level. So whatever it is that you're, you're at or where you want to get to, you'll eventually get to it because it, you know, water finds its level. You're going you're gonna to push for it. You're going to keep on fighting for it. You're going to keep on doing it. And eventually you get to the point you get to the level where you're comfortable with it and you don't want to proceed anymore. So I've had, I have friends early on um, when I first started, when we were much younger and we were like, we're going to take over the world, we're going to do all this stuff. And we were so eager on learning every aspect of, how do I code? How do I, how do I launch? How do I set servers? How do I set databases? How do I do all this stuff? And as the career progressed, they get that nice sign-on bonus, the offer letter from a big corporate, and they think they made it. And uh, they sit down, they realize, oh, steady paycheck is really nice. All these freebies, free food, free, you know, nice offices is also really nice. Six months later, they're, they're, they get so bored because they feel like they're always having to do just one little thing, whereas before they were, so, they were covering so many different things. They complain and complain. Sometimes people actually would take the initiative to say, I'm going to jump off and go, to, go do another project. So you tend to see that a lot in, in the Valley where uh, people get bored and then move on to something else. But then you also get a lot of people where they're just like, okay, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to complain. I'm going to stick around. And then after, after a year or so, you, you kind of reach back to them and say, hey, how are you guys doing? They tell you, you know what? I'm actually very happy. I don't have the stress where I have to deal with every single fire that happens. If, if something happens, then I know that in the back of my mind, I could just write one email and someone down the hallway or somewhere around there can, can help me take care of it. And the reassurance of having a team dynamic where I don't have to stress about everything they get to a point where they feel very comfortable about that and they feel very good about that. And so I think it's just a matter of what is it you're trying to pursue? This goes back to what I was saying. That goes back to what is it that you want to pursue? What is that drive? Why do you want to do this? And just be open to the fact that there's not be so many ways for that to happen, right? And if you're accepting of it and you're always open to opportunities, you're always eager to learn, you're going you're gonna to be okay. Can't promise you that you're going to end up uh, you're gonna end up being the next Zuckerberg or the next, you know, the next big shot billionaire, blah blah blah. But you're gonna be fine. Um, that said, it always rounds back to just taking a look and saying, hey, you know what? Um, what is it I could do to to help myself and help the team? That kind of eagerness, that kind of mentality, will always have someone willing to talk to you and say, hey, maybe you're a good fit for our team. Jay, so you talked about this a little bit already, but how? How do you recommend a developer to keep from getting complacent? I think part of that is always, always be curious and always find just always think to yourself not to be in the position of saying, <clears throat> this is it. Um, there's, there's, there's always a, there's always something else new coming out. And you also, you also on the other thing to also think about too, is technology is now a very global, a global landscape. Whereas before it might have felt like, um, you have to come to Silicon Valley. You have to come to San Francisco in order for you to make it. And the last few years, especially the last year, as we're kind of focusing more so on remote uh, working and stuff like that, and just the fact that there's so many other cities that's popping up and also having a great uh, technology field or, or space there. Um, technology is really now a global dynamic and you're just one part of that and so one aspect of it is you can't be complacent because it's a very competitive field and it's a very and we're trying to lower the entry uh the the barrier of entry every single day and so everyone going around saying we should teach coding to to grade school children saying that we need to teach coding to coal miners we need to teach coding to people in africa this and that 
that type of initiative is never going to stop. There's always going to be uh, forces out there, groups out there, communities out there where they will see technology as a means for them to kind of get through the next few years, the next generation and so forth. So you're always going to be having someone somewhere eager to also do what it is that you're doing. So you always have to kind of be always forward looking and saying to yourself, how do I self-improve? How do I keep on looking for new things to try? How do I keep on learning for new things? Um, and then likewise, also taking a look and saying to yourself like, okay, once I do all this stuff, um, you know, like not to be afraid of the fact that you're going to be replaced, but looks, looking towards how do I also help other people? Um, you might find after a while that if you get comfortable in knowing um, a lot of what you do, your trade or your craft, to also start looking outwards and say, maybe I should teach as well. And I find that teaching is also a great in, in, invigorating way of kind of recapturing that spirit of what got you into the space as well. If you can't honestly explain to another individual as to how you do X, Y, and Z, have you truly mastered what it is that you've done or have you just kind of barely kind of know it? Right. So inevitably you get to the point where um, if you feel like I, I don't want to do any more, I feel like this is it. I feel like this is, you know, there's not much more to it. I think the next step to look to is just trying to help someone else also get to where you are. Hey, Jerry, I, I, I'm probably making this number up, but I, I mean, I think you agree with me. The, the future of, of code is pretty, pretty good, right? Because I think I'm making this number up again. I, I'm pretty sure, but I think earlier we had heard that there's like 20,000 empty coding jobs in Seattle. Of course, then we have Amazon, Microsoft, Expedia. But there's like coding jobs all over the place, right? It's this pretty, you know, I want to say easy field to get into, but the opportunities there, correct? I think opportunities there, and I think it's also it's also if you if you take a step back and you look at it from like a micro a macro economics kind of perspective, um, you're also on this curve on this curve line, right? The jobs will always be there. It, it just then becomes a, a matter of you know is the pay level gonna gonna correspond to that? And it could be that there's a shortage of, of <clears throat> you know, bodies and headcounts, and therefore you could find yourself in a really good situation where um, you can leverage those things into like a good payout. Um, there's also situations where you know the there's certain there's certain specific fields in computer science and, and software engineering where it does take a long lead time in terms of understanding something very specific before they'll pick you up for something like that. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're knee deep into you know, machine learning research, if you're knee deep into general AI research, those type of stuff requires a good solid PhD before you even get to that, into, into something meaningful, doing something meaningful in that space. And so there are definitely gonna be more opportunities. There's definitely gonna be more ways that you could find yourself working in the industry um whether or not the pay were, were commiserate to or, or you know relate to it that's another factor my thing has been way back way back then i always kind of saw uh inevitably that uh, a job in computer science or or computer engineering might be very similar to eventually being like a blue collar job uh in I, america I, I, yeah i remember there's an article on that a couple months ago like you know comparing coders like the code miners and no blue collar workers it's the future blue collar worker and it's I, I agree with that yeah so you get to the point where like inevitably that could happen if everyone else surrounds you like if every every joe bob mary sue if everyone knows how to code right then do you have something that's unique or special then you have to really figure out how to seek out something that makes you stand out because at that point it then becomes a retail level job and you know what though here's the funny thing so so in my transition over from um, uh, the technology world into the food the restaurant space. There was one thing I kind of thought that was kind of interesting. Uh, when I was working and, and talking to other business owners, owner operators, the emphasis on, on technology isn't quite there because their background isn't, you know, from technology. So their background is figure out how to make you a really delicious plate of food or a great drink or being, you know, making a space really hospitable for you. So therefore you want to go back and revisit. They're really good at crafting that kind of experience. And when I got into the space and I'm hiring for my team, I'm trying to build my team out, I'm trying to build my culture out. What I noticed that is 18 year olds are actually very, even though they might not sit there and actually code out individually on the laptop, the amount of extra work they have to do nowadays amounts to them almost being like a coder. And what I mean by that is if you sit there and you think about it, right now across America, all these different restaurants, you have 18, 19 year olds, teenagers, maybe even younger than that, 
where they're told your job now isn't necessarily just to say, I'm gonna take your order, press a button on the screen like McDonald's. Your job now is to figure out how to deal with DoorDash, figure out how to crunch in the right numbers, contact the right people, figure out how to you know, fulfill something, figure out how to go from one system to another process to another system to another process. That inevitably is computer science based. You're stuck in this world where all these other coders have literally built all these little screens around you. And your job is to operate every single one of those. And so you're stuck in this loop that a coder has made for you. And what I saw is that if you have the drive to, to kind of see yourself in that situation, there are, there are people who are driven to say, I want to improve that. And I have people that's amazing on my team where they kind of see all these little, little elements of like, I have five different iPads now I have to monitor in order to figure out where their stuff is going in. They come to me and they say, hey, Jerry, I have this amazing idea. What if we do blah and blah and blah? Or what if we organize it this way? Or what if we do it this way? And that right there was, to me, it was a reminder, like you are literally just like reshaping the matrix in a way in a coding in the in a computer science type of way without you even realizing it of coding and so i think the con the concepts are really great that we're kind of spreading this out i think inevitably a lot of people are going to pick up a lot of computer science concepts that we we now take for granted but back then it was all pioneered by really smart people over at big colleges big universities putting all this all their career into it um, and now we're in a situation where a lot of this coding stuff, it, it's kind of getting more, more natural for people to kind of participate in. So inevitably, your job is to figure out, be one level up above that. Hey, Jerry, not to geek out too much about tech, but I don't think a lot of really people realize how like detailed tech is. Right? When, I, when I got involved with tech like a few years ago, like I didn't realize it was front end, back end. A lot of people think coding language, like one language. No, it's really like, you know, React, you know, <laughs> Node.js, Kotlin, yep. on Rails. You know, if you, you had to do something for the, the platform, the website, the Android app, the iOS app, yep. you I mean, not don't geek out too much. Can you talk about a little how, about, how complicated that is? It, it does get complicated, but then at the same time, I feel like it's one of those things where um, I think it, it's a matter of trying to build your comfort level with it. Um, and, and what I mean by that, for example, is I have friends that have uh, autom autom automotive repair shops or service shops. And so if you take a look at a car in the beginning, if you're not well versed, so for example, I'm not well versed with, uh, with, with vehicles. Like when I took my ASVAB, I scored pretty high on everything except for the mechanical part, right? I, they're asking me what a monkey wrench is or what this wrench stuff is. And I was like, I have absolutely no clue. I don't know any of that stuff. I'm just not comfortable in that space. Now, when I talk to people who, who are, you know, who are very comfortable with, with, with cars, vehicles, engines, mechanical stuff, to them, yes, on the outset, it looks like it's very complicated. You have to deal with things like the engine part, the transmission, the clutch, you have to deal with electronics and deal with all this stuff. But they could think through it as a whole. They could think through the whole system as a whole. And so the inevitability is, is that if you dip your toe into technology, you are going to be on this long journey of trying to figure out how to discover the system as a whole. And so what that entails then become is just because you're like frustrated by the fact that a website doesn't have the image the way that you want it. And you think to yourself, I want to try to inspect the code. I'm going to try to figure out, learn how to build the site the way I want it gets you on this process of saying, well, now I got to learn front end. I got to learn jQuery in order for me to do some animations, for example, that leads you to realizing jQuery might be limited in certain ways. So now you have to learn JavaScript. And next thing you know, you're like, well, now I know how to do the JavaScript. I got to do the back end and this and that and that. Now, if you are the type of person that finds that enjoyable, you're going to be fine. If you're the type of person where like, I just don't like doing that stuff. <laughs> Guess what? You're probably gonna be a better fit to say, I'm gonna specialize. I'm gonna specialize in only this thing. And I'm gonna go seek out teams in which my specialty can benefit the team overall, right? So there's different strategies now involved in terms of what you like and don't like. And so don't necessarily be intimidated by the fact that there might be so much things going on. Just look at it from the perspective of like, how do I strategize in a way that I could use maybe my weaknesses to, as, as a potential strength or how do, I, how do I find myself specializing rather than generalizing? 
or if you find yourself specializing isn't something I want to do, there are still lots of roles for a generalized person in technology and it actually serves you to, to kind of maybe try to figure out, find out, figure out how all that stuff works. So there's the, the path for everybody, there's room for everybody. The space is huge. Everyone's getting into it. You all have to think about it one way or another. So it's not that bad. So Jerry, having said that, are there characteristics that people might have that lend themselves to not being successful coders? I think so. I think one thing too is I've seen this, I've seen this played out in a couple, in a couple situations. Um, one particular situation has been, there are people who are very talented, extremely talented um, in a sense where the way that their brain operates literally is just, just like a computer, right? So that's just how their brain is wired. They could, they could do that, you know, Neo in the matrix type of approach where like they see all the little, little symbols going around everywhere. That's how they think. They could think logically. They could th think systematically. They can think mathematically all in their heads, all this stuff. Fantastic. But guess what? Being that talented in that role, you can't not single-handedly um, figure out how to take on the world. And inevitably, I think team, I think being part of a team or working in a team being able to communicate with others is also equally as important of a skill set as you knowing how to code. And so I found times in situations where those type of people might be put into, into a good role where they say, we want to make use of your talent to try to push the boundaries a little bit or to do this and do that, make a new algorithm, crunch out some new numbers, crunch the data set faster, be more efficient, blah, blah, blah. They get put into that role and they just go into a deep rabbit hole and they never come out of it. And it pushes people away from working with them. And it makes the whole team dynamic a miserable experience. And it ends up in a situation where inevitably they have to be let go. It doesn't matter how talented you are, if at the end of the day, you're put into a team dynamic, just like the military. If you're gonna be a hotshot cowboy shooting off guns everywhere, you're not gonna be a good fit. And there's gonna be, the system itself is gonna try to figure out how to push you out of that because inevitably you're gonna end up as a liability rather than an asset. So the, so, so the, so the, days, all, so the days of the stereotypical engineer or software developer being a cubicle by themselves and grind out code is like those days are pretty much gone, right? I think those are definitely way gone. I think we're way past that kind of particular uh, point just because the, the complexity and, and the amount of work that we've been kind of put out has put yourself out of that now, right? So for example, if you want to make, if you want to, the biggest example right now is software is software is one of those things where a lot more people are gaining more accessibility to it, which is fantastic. Um, it, it, the internet is democratizing your, your ability to participate, fantastic. But then if you pull yourself back and you say to yourself, okay, this is all fine. I want to go bare metal. I want to make silicon. I want to make the chips that goes inside the machines. You're not going to do that single handedly you're gonna have to rely on the team. You're gonna, you know, it doesn't matter where you are, whether it's Apple, Google, whether it's gonna be uh, at Intel, whatever, you're still gonna be stuck in the team and you still have to be putting in team efforts. You still have to be part of a, a, a greater whole than yourself. And so the complexity required to, to build that versus what was done back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010 to now, it just, it's escalated, right? Like you have Moore's law that just kept on kind of keeping, keeping us up on this high curve. You are single-handedly not gonna superhuman yourself into that situation and knowing how to do every single one of those things. So now I think the effort is better placed on how do I work in the team dynamic? And not only that, how do I communicate? How do I share what I know? So that way I'm not the one having to do all the work. Here's the other thing too, the last part. Eventually you get to the point where <clears throat> everyone does this. I think sometimes the best coders are the laziest coders. I've heard that plenty of times. <laughs> Just because, you know, if you are able to do a lot of things, you're going to be excited early on to do a lot of things. Then you're going to get tired and you're going to get bored and you find yourself, I only want to do the cool things or the fun things. And so inevitably you get to a point where you're just like, I don't want to do so much work. Like I can single-handedly build out the whole website, set up the server, launch it, publish it, do all that stuff. But why? You know what I'm saying? Like, but why? Like if, if I could delegate that out, 
if I could delegate that out and I could go home at five o'clock and enjoy my dinner and, and you know, have some family time or, or do this and do that, why am I stuck in the office nonstop doing this stuff, right? And so I think inevitably you get to a point where everyone ages to the point where they're just realizing I could do the work, but I don't want to. So maybe the best trick I could figure out now is how do I put myself in a situation where I could teach other people or communicate to other people to all share in a workload so that way we could succeed together rather than me having to do it all by myself. So I think everyone ends up at that wall. And now how you get past that wall is up to you. You could choose. So we just lost Jerry, so he should hopefully he'll come back on. All right, Jerry. Yeah, there he goes off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Silly. We work. What can I say? So yeah. So I think the the last part I was saying was just trying to figure out how to uh, work together as a team, just because you know I think everyone gets to the point where they're gonna face that 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 moment of truth where they realize I could be doing all the work, I could take all the I could do the blaze of glory, and I could take all the credit. Blah blah blah. But why should I? But why? I could go home. I could have a good work-life balance. All it really takes is to figure out how to work together as a team, communicate well, teach, share, and uh, take on leadership. So therefore, people can all benefit from the project you're working on. So Jerry, next, a two-part question. First part is like, pose as a developer, a developer out there. He's doing his job. He's a good coder. And is he has a, and he's working for someone who's a founder. And they're, and they're like, they know the basics about tech, they know how to code, they really don't know anything about it, right? And you know, the coder is like putting his work, doing what he needs to do, but the, the startup front is kind of impatient, like you're not going fast enough, you're not going fast enough, what's going on? How does the coder like manage expectations, right? And the second part is like, how does a not tech founder make sure like they're not being taken advantage of by a coder, so to speak, right? Mm. This is, so this is great. So this is after, after I did my stint over in corporate in startup world, um, I spent four years uh, doing consulting and I really, really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, I got to, I got to be able to work on different projects. I got to work on projects intimately with, with founders. Um, I get to, I get to have more leeway rather than being stuck in the corporate environment where maybe I, I get, feel like I feel stifled. And in my experience of consulting, what I realized now is twofold. Uh, project management is hard. It is extremely hard. Uh, time estimation is extremely hard. And that's not to say that just because you say that out loud, that somehow you're absolved of your responsibility from being good at it, right? Like it just means that you have to figure out how to put a little bit more attention on it. And so, what I learned is a couple of things. One is definitely, again, it comes back to this, communicate well. Figure out how to be ahead of the curve a little bit. If, if you're gonna, the rule of thumb that I've been taught has always been whatever timeline you're gonna give out, multiply it by three. Because most likely, most likely it will be accurate. Worst case is not be accurate. Uh, no, best case is not be accurate. Worst case is that maybe you go over it. And you know what, honestly, if you even end up ahead of it, you're gonna be a winner anyways, right? So always try to figure out how to pad in that time. When I first started to the consulting part and I was working with people and projects and stuff like that, I thought I wanna, I wanna be accurate because that was my tendency as a developer, as a as software engineer was I, I valued accuracy over anything else because you're working with code. Code either works or doesn't. So therefore accuracy is a big value set. So I thought I was treat, I would treat project management the same way. I would accurately give you my assessment at the time of saying that this is how it's on take. Then as I get through it, either it's factors out of my control or in my control, whether it's, uh, whether it's change orders from the, the stakeholder or it's gonna be me overestimating my capabilities, the time slips. 
And that's when the accuracy comes to bite me in the butt at the end. There's only so much sympathy you could get out of people by saying, I missed this deadline <laughs> towards the end. Um, and once you kind of play out that sympathy card, you get to a situation where none of that matters anymore, right? And so I started learning, okay, you have to then figure out how to communicate and work with people who are not as uh, accurate as say as computers, right? It's a two different worlds. And so with people, I think what you really have to do is you really have to figure out how to maintain a good relationship by being transparent, by communicating, by building up trust, by building, by doing all these lot of soft, soft skills, right? Um, so one thing is definitely figure out how to know in your mind, based on experience, what your track record looks like, what your work record looks like. Give people, give people way longer leeway, so therefore you can find yourself the time to be able to do it. And then also kind of also think through like how can you communicate in a really simple in, in the simplified way what are the challenges you're going through so therefore you could also share out the risks that you're you're, you're tackling so that way that other stakeholders who may not be technical can go in on that with you because people want to see you succeed so if you kind of let them understand you know what there is a risk here if you want to make this change order if you want to build out this feature the risk could be that we have to spend more time more effort more resources on it they have to make that prioritization for you right and so if you have a good working relationship on both sides you could help out with that prioritization you could understand that prioritization um, and you're not going to feel like you're stuck having to always do that type of stuff. That's a very corporate kind of mindset where you get stuck where you'll have to do stuff you don't want to do. Um, that said, the flip side, if you're a founder, if you're a tech founder, if, if, you, if you are trying to build up something, or you could even just be a business operator that is trying to hire somebody to help you rebuild your website, you know, it all goes all levels. What you should really focus on is a couple of things, just like the way that you would seek out somebody to help you rebuild, remodel your kitchen or your bathroom. One, definitely look into whether or not the person you wanna work with has any referrals, any word of mouth, any, any reviews, any, any, any way to kind of get a judge of whether or not they're gonna be good at what they do. See past, because also you might, you're probably not gonna sit there and analyze the GitHub profile because that's just not you know, part of your day. That's not something you wanna do. So really, it then comes from the fact that is there a social proof that I should work with this person? Is this gonna be a, a good situation to be in? And the second part too is get the person that's working with you to come up with a plan and stick with that plan. Because the thing too is also, there's gonna be a point where developers wanna play this leeway where they say to yourself, you know what? This is just so complicated. I'm the only one that knows how to do it. And then they're gonna try to figure out how to like, throw out the magic hands and wave all this stuff away. So definitely make them commit to a plan and stick to that plan. Set incentives for completing the plan. And so making it so that your payment uh, for the project is in piecemeal, that release of the payment is gonna be dependent on milestones that the developers achieve. So therefore it's fair all across the board. And you know what, at a certain point, you really just gotta figure out how to cut someone loose if it's a situation where it just doesn't work out anymore. I have been in situations where I have, well, I was doing consulting where I get brought into jobs where the person was saying to me, hey, I've been working with the developer for close to two years, two years or more. Oh. Oh. I've been paying him regularly, but I still can't get to where I gotta go. And when I, I talk to them, I say, okay, let's, let's, open up the hood and then see what's inside it. And you realize code is missing. What was promised is not delivered, blah, 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 blah. It really is a, one of those situations where it's, it, it, it's very risky. It's a very risky endeavor overall to invest money into software engineering, into development, to invest into, into websites. Don't cheap out on it. You definitely have to pay the right price for it. Also don't get ripped off by paying too much for it. But also, if you feel like you're getting a too good of a deal, that's also a good, a good sign that this is not going to work out. Coding takes time. It takes knowledge. All those things get built up. And so if someone comes in and say, you know what, my billable rate is X amount. And someone from far off in a third world country comes to you and say, my rate could be way less that. Don't just jump on that rate. 
you still need to figure out how to have a face-to-face -face good working relationship. You have to build up that trust. You have to figure out how to find someone that communicates well. You have to figure out how to, you know, instill a good business contract into the process. You have to put in the right incentives to motivate the person to get it done. So if you cheap out on them early on, you're both screwed. You know what I'm saying? Like that person that's developing doesn't want to sit there. Maybe they, they, they say they'll take a lower rate just so they could get a job, but now they're screwed because they can't make any money off of it. There's no more incentive for them to stick around with it. So it really is a both sides type of situation where you have to balance out the, the incentives and the needs on both sides, right? Developers need to communicate really well. They need to pad the time so therefore they can manage the time management really well. The project owners or the stakeholders needs to figure out how to incentivize correctly. They need to figure out how to verify. They need to understand that, you know, developers can't just work for cheap. They can't be just treated like uh, throwaway code monkeys and stuff like that. And you have to really figure out how to get both sides to work. It's rare. And that's the reason why so many projects fail. <laughs> that's the reason why there's so many dead end projects everywhere. So the only thing you could do to get better out of it though is again, Focus on communication, focus on teams, focus on a lot of the soft skills that ends up being the business part of this, right? So you could be the best artist in the world. You could be a Rembrandt, you could be a Michelangelo, you know how to work the brush, you know how to do the colors, blah, blah, blah. But guess what, at the end of the day, if you're not gonna be a good business person to figure out how to do all that stuff, you're not gonna get that far, so. Thanks, Jared, that's a great point. So fixing subjects a little bit, let's switch to Bunker Labs. So me and Jerry both are volunteer at Bunker Labs, me in Seattle and, and Jerry down the Bay Area. So what Bunker Labs does, we help military veterans, military spouses and military dependents, pretty much anyone in the military connect community, start companies and grow the companies, right? And we're like across the United States. Um, Jerry, so you can talk about some of what's going on down the Bay Area with Bunker sure. Labs. I love Bunker Labs. So uh, I got the, uh, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate in the Bunker Labs program. It is a national program. Um, they're based, I believe, in DC, if anything, or so Chicago. Uh, Chicago, my bad. Headquarters in Chicago, yeah. Head headquarters in Chicago. And they have a, uh, a program called Vet Veterans in Residence in a partnership with WeWork. And what's been helpful so far has been it is a six month program in which you're part of a cohort uh, in the individual city. So each city has a chapter. Uh, my chapter is in the SF Bay Area. We're based out of San Francisco. Jason is based out of Seattle. There's also chapters out in LA, New York, Chicago, different places and so forth. And going through the six month pro process, you get to be part of a team um, that is going through and trying to figure out how to really boost your business as a veteran, right? And that comes with it a couple of different things. One is you have the challenge of figuring out how to actually get something started. You have the challenge of figuring out how to portray or share out your story specifically as a veteran business owner um, or a veteran spouse or, uh, or a current military person all across the board. And I've been in this program now for two cohorts already. And this is now my third cycle. And this cycle, I'm now kind of elevated to a alumni captain, which then entails that I should be in a better, I should be in a role now where I should definitely nurture and mentor and kind of push and boost people up more so. So I'm really excited about that opportunity. What we're focusing on this round is to, we're still stuck doing virtual just because of what's happening. Uh, with the pandemic and so forth. And so we're going to rely on virtual in order for us to kind of combine together and kind of really shape ourselves the next upcoming six months to gather up the skill sets, to gather up the confidence, to gather up the resources that we could use to benefit ourselves. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, it's it's been a great experience so far. And the one key value I could get out of it, aside from the fact that we get to partner with WeWork and have access to WeWork buildings, is the fact that it reignited re a part of something that I felt was missing when I actually left the Marine Corps way, way back then, which is a sense of esprit de corps, the sense of team camaraderie. When I was in the Marine Corps, one, you know, having lots of challenges was just normal, normal days, right? For us, um, you might be told that your mission is to tackle this, to do this, to do that, and you don't have enough time, resources, people, <laughs> equipment. You just told to make do, right? And 
back then it felt really intimidating. It felt really, really hard. But the thing that was able to get myself and other people across is just to know that there's people backing you up. People next to you, to the right, to the left of you, in front of you, behind you, whatever the case may be, they're going to help you out because you guys, we all wore the same uniform and we all are in it together. When I left the service, when I left the military, I got back into the civilian world, that, that kind of feeling, I've never been able to capture it anywhere else. Whether it's at a big corporation where they would tell you all kinds of stuff saying, hey, we're here for you. We got all kinds of services for you to even small startups where they try to portray the team as like, we're in the family, like we're all families, we're all work together. We, you know, we, we work together, we eat together, we hang out together, we drink together and we're family. But even though, even if that's the case in the back of your mind, you say like, this isn't quite it. This is not quite it, right? And so when I was able to participate in the Bunker Labs program in veterans and residents, um, being part of a cohort, being with other people, you find connections within that cohort that empowers you to feel like, hey, they're going through the same bullshit I'm going through. They're having the same frustrations with time management, with personnel management, trying to figure out how to get financing, trying to figure out how to do paperwork, trying to do this and do that. They're going through the same thing. And that makes it so that it feels like I could do it too. Because if I find a, if I find a tip, I find a shortcut, I'm gonna share that. If they find a tip or a shortcut, they're gonna share that with me back. And so that has, that literally empower me to then tackle bigger challenges that I myself would probably would not have done. So now a year later, looking back, my growth came from so many different ways, partly from Bunker Labs, actually sharing resources, uh, seminars, master classes, information and knowledge in which they made me understand or learn something new to the fact that just having, feeling like I have a home base out of a WeWork office to the comfort of that, to also the ability to say, hey, you know what? I could call up certain people in my cohort whether they're in now or in the past that I could still rely on them to kind of give me some pep talk or give me some heads up or give me some information. All of that made it so that I could be where I am now, having the comfort, having the confidence to say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna try to open up a restaurant in the worst year possible to take on a restaurant business, right? But to me, I'm like, you know what? It's possible because of the fact that there's other people with me at the same time in the VRR trying to figure out how to tackle that problem. Jerry, can you talk some about your restaurant business? So I have, this is, this is a fun thing. So in the, um, three years ago, when I switched gears, um, <clears throat> I had an inkling, uh, this little idea, this little startup idea, where I felt like there was, there was, a, there was a particular thing that everyone does. And you can't escape it no matter what. And it's more pervasive than just technology. And that's the idea that people eat. Everyone eats, no matter what, you know? Throughout the day, multiple times on a day, one time a day, or sometimes, and that's happening now more and more, sometimes they don't really eat at all for that day. So based on that gut kind of gut feeling, I was thinking to myself, what I really want to try to pursue is that I'm really interested in, in trying to figure out <clears throat> how to how to instill some technology into the restaurant space because I feel like that could be a, a good market space for for some innovation for changes and so forth. So rather than rather than saying to myself, I'm just gonna start a company and uh... hey Jerry, I think you went on mute. Am I on mute? Yeah, I can hear you now. I think it just goes in and out. I think something's wrong yeah. with the, the Wi-Fi. So, um, but yeah, so what, what I was saying was, you know, my thinking at the time was rather than build a company that I'm just going to build products and try to sell to restaurant owners, I'm just going to go ahead and start a restaurant. I'm going to do it the hard way. I'm going to do it like the, the Mustang way. I'm going to try to figure out how being listed and I'm going to switch over to the officer level, right? Um, I started this whole process. Uh, my, my, my MOS in the Marine Corps was a Marine combat engineer. And so I was well versed with construction, with doing all these different types of stuff. So I was super happy about that. And I started this process of, of building out a uh, ice cream shop. I built out a boba shop and I now currently just built up a, a cafe, 
uh, serving out specialty coffee. And along the way, I learned so much in terms of like, this is, this is the ground level. Like imagine if you're just trying to figure out how to get started a business service, a service type of business is probably the most convenient, most straightforward, accessible type of way. But even then, there is still so many different challenges. Cash flow is a problem. Hiring is a problem. Training is a problem. You really get into the nitty gritty of doing the business at the very bare level with like very minimal amount of resources. And I just took that challenge as much as I can. And along the way, learned a lot of what could be done better to technology. So I'm very grateful for that experience so far. This year, I'm looking forward to actually executing on some of those ideas because now I have the insider view, right? By being able to open up these restaurants and these, these cafes, I have the insider view of understanding that there might be a, a corresponding or correlating or relatable challenge that a lot of people have. I can introduce new products and kind of go from there. Um, What's funny though, is along the way, this past couple of years, I get bombarded by sales calls from lots of people <laughs> with technology solutions. So there's always someone eager to sell me a better scheduling software, uh, a better hiring software, a better training software, a better payroll software, a better payment processor, better POS, tons of solution providers in the space. So um, that kind of goes to show like it's a huge space, lots of innovations could happen. I'm super excited about this year, uh, leveraging Bunker Labs, Veterans in Residence, leveraging my past experience of opening up the, the stores to then kind of say to myself, okay, now's the time. What do I do to build up a technology business that can then benefit a lot of these uh, business owner operators? Jerry, is there anything that you want to talk about or anything that I did not ask you that you want to talk about? Um, at this time, at this time, I think one of the things I'm really fascinated by is just if, I think I think what's happening now is there it, there is a very unique change um, brought on by particularly the pandemic um, and how global it is, which is this idea that um, in my view of it, it's coming from a small business owner operator, which is that at the at the lower level, a lot of businesses are going out. They're just they're just they're just being taken out. And what ends up happening is, is that you have the corporations who are able to kind of survive this long term. Um, if you head out, if, if, if you have the ability to head out for essential trips or for whatever the case may be, and you're in need of something, whether it is a coffee or a food, I think what's ended up happening now is most times people end up going to drive throughs which is convenient. Uh, you have your Starbucks drive throughs you have your McDonald's, you have your fast food, you have all that stuff. They're thriving. If you ever take a chance to sit there and just look, they're thriving. The line for those drive throughs are around the block. Um, if you take a look at corporate chains, franchises, um, Domino's is thriving, pizza shops are thriving, but the local shops are not. And so I think there is gonna be something really interesting going into the next generation where this is gonna reverberate throughout. Focus more so on being an entrepreneur, focus more so on being a small business owner, and focus more so on being an owner operator. Because I think the next couple of years, the title used to be back in the past, everyone wants to be an entrepreneur. Everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, and everyone wants to be a tech founder, and they want to be this, they want to be that. But my thesis now is going forward, I think people will want to be something different. They want to be an owner operator, because that is actually a really hard thing to do. And the joy you get out of it though, the success you get out of it though, is gonna be way more interesting than just being an entrepreneur. I think entrepreneur is just a, a blanket word now that everyone uses just because they wanna say that they, that's what they are. But I think the next level to that is you wanna be an owner operator. You wanna figure out how to own assets because that's the only way for you to get wealth in America. And the second part is you have to be an operator. You have to learn how to operate your business because if you're capable of doing that, you are having, you'll have a way to figure out how to scale that out and figure out how to build up more wealth. So working by itself is great and all. Seeking to be an entrepreneur is great and all. But I think where a lot of people are going to end up in the next couple of years is kind of say to themselves, I am now an owner operator. I have an LLC. I have an S Corp. I have whatever the case may be. That is going to be my partnership. And I'm going to head off. And I'm going to try to figure out how to go find my hidden treasure somewhere. 
And so to all those type of people out there that resonates with that or kind of get that sense um, and you guys need help, definitely reach out to me. I would love to kind of connect with more people where they kind of say to themselves, I got the entrepreneurship bug, but I'm past that now. I'm at this point where I grew up, I'm mature a little bit. I have an actual business. I have it licensed. I have it, you know, I have it permitted. It's been operating for a little bit. I'm getting a little bit of revenue stream, but I want to grow it. And so therefore, as the owner operator, what is it I could do to improve myself to figure out how to get that to go? Jerry, can you share your social media so people can reach out to you? Sure. Fantastic. So definitely find me on Twitter. Uh, I am Yo Jerry Wang, J-E-R-Y-W-A-N-G on Twitter. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn with the same username. So find me on LinkedIn uh, at Yo Jerry Wang. Um, I'm trying something new now as well. So if you have a chance, uh, find me on Clubhouse because everyone has, seems to be having a Clubhouse. Yeah, I, want, I just got on there too. <laughs> But, um, but Clubhouse is a very engaging platform. I definitely enjoy it. So you can also find me there. Um, yeah, so those would be the three primary places to find me. I used to have a website, but my website domain expires. So I'm going to try to figure out how to get that back this year. So. And to our listeners, we'll have his links on our show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshoblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends. And be sure to uh, subscribe, rate, and review the Jason Cabinet's experience on your favorite podcast platform. So Jerry, we come to never talk. Can you provide us any advice or wisdom on anything you want to talk about? Um, yeah, definitely figure out if you want to be on this path of being a coder, uh, there are lots of resources. I could definitely point you to different directions. Um, if you're going to be past that a little bit and you say to yourself, I'm itching to be an entrepreneur, there's also lots of resources that I recommend, especially if you're a military member or a spouse, definitely look into Bunker Labs. Uh, there's lots of resources I could point you in that direction. And if you're past the entrepreneurship level and you're at that point where you have a viable business, a small business, you're looking to grow and scale that out, reach out to me as well. I can definitely have resources for you to help grow from there as well. Jerry, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. No worries. Thank you for the time. And to our listeners, thanks for your time as well. And remember to be great every day.